here to talk about Silicon Valley real estate market week number 11. We also look at the greater Bay Area, which includes five regions, 13 counties. I believe that this is the most up-to-date, i.e. current data and most extensive data focused here on Silicon Valley. We'll come back to these URLs at the end. I'm Richard Calhoun with Creekside Realty, willing to work with buyers or sellers here in Silicon Valley. Here is our first data slide. What we're doing here is simply looking at the active listings today compared to the same level of inventory for the past 10 years. For example, in South County at 62.7 or 63%, that means we're basically about two thirds of the inventory we normally have at this time of the year in that micro market region. One of the reasons I look at micro market regions, you can see there's a big difference. Redwood City has 22% above the normal level at 122% of the normal level of inventory. And Saratoga Los Gatos, for example, only has 54% of the normal inventory. So if you were to put those two in a blender and mix them up, you end up with, you know, about the normal inventory, but neither area is experiencing normal inventory. So it's really important to look at what the market conditions that are in each area that you're interested in investing, selling, or buying. Now we're flipping over and looking at the number of offers. And basically the concept is the same. What are the level of offers accepted this year compared to the level of offers accepted over the past 10 years? And I use the level of offers instead of pending sales as many people do. And the reason the pending sales has an issue, if a particular transaction is in escrow for five weeks, it counts as a pending sale for five weeks. But if that same transaction was in escrow for 10 weeks, which is pretty darn long, but if it happens and it does happen, then that would count for 10 weeks. If someone's a cash transaction is only in escrow for one week, it only counts for one out of five weeks. So the data is skewed. I look at the offer date because every offer has one offer date and I count that data for five weeks. And here you can see there's basically a lack of inventory anywhere from the least inventory uh, offers accepted happening in Foster City at 57% to the most happening in Redwood City at 102%. Now we move on and we're looking at the days of unsold inventory. Days of unsold inventory is the ratio between the active inventory and the number of offers. It's the speed of the marketplace. And again, we're looking at the speed of the marketplace this week compared to the previous 10 years. And here, a low number is a faster market. So the fact that the part of Silicon Valley is somewhere around three quarters, 75, 78% of the DUI that it normally has says that you have a market that's about 25% faster than it normally is. If you go up into San Mateo County, the general market is right about 100%, but you have two areas that really stand out. The coast, almost at 200%, at 190% of normal. So it's almost twice as slow as normal. And Foster City, Redwood Shores, is basically at 167% or one and two thirds. So it's two thirds of a market slower than it normally is. So definitely a slower marketplace up there. But with Foster City and Redwood Shores, it's a very small geographical area with very few limited sales. In fact, I think I saw eight active listings there. So it could just be a statistical and most likely is a statistical fluctuation because all the surrounding areas are doing better than the coast. And the coast is sort of isolated, so it could be doing different. Foster City really isn't that different than Redwood City or San Carlos. And therefore, I would expect this is more statistical fluctuation based on the size. And that's one of the reasons you can't look at data at, at the zip code level, in my opinion. There simply isn't a large enough sample size to get reasonable data. That's the reason I invented this concept of micro markets. And there's 20 micro markets in Silicon Valley. Here now, for the first time, is we're just looking at the days of unsold inventory compared to today. It's not compared to anything, you know, just what is the raw count. Basically, I consider anything under six weeks to be a seller's marketplace, anything over 11 weeks to be a buyer's marketplace. You can see the only area over 11 weeks, again, is the San Mateo County coast. Even the expensive areas in San Mateo County come in and right at 10 weeks. I can do the math pretty quickly. And you can see the heart of Silicon Valley is down around 15, 16 days of unsold inventory. That is a very fast market. The rest of Silicon Valley is somewhere around 30 days, which is still a pretty fast marketplace. Again, basically anything under six weeks to 40 days, I consider to be a 
seller's marketplace. And that's why the red color, red is typically seller favoring the seller, blue is typically favoring the buyer. Here's days on market. And instead of looking at the average, which gets impacted by that one transaction that sells after being on the market for the year, or the median, which is a very stable index. And when it does move, it basically moves by a whole day at a time. I look at the 75th percentile. So what I call this is the long typical seller. We're only looking at sellers that are successful. So we're ignoring those sellers that come on the marketplace and are, want twice what their house is worth and are never going to sell. You know, because I'm looking at the days on, uh, on the market for the time to get an offer. If they don't get an offer, then they never count in the, this metric. So it's the reasonable sellers that are taking longer. Or another way to look at it is 25% of the sellers take longer than this. So if we look at Milpitas, North Valley, Berryessa, only 25% of the sellers that are successful are taking long longer than eight days. 75% are selling in under eight days. So basically in under a week. It is fast, but it's not that unusual because down here you have Union City and Newark also at eight days. And then you have Cupertino and Sunnyvale at nine days. Most of Silicon Valley is happening right around 10 days. That is a fast marketplace. 75% of those that are going to sell are going to sell in that first 10 days. That's basically two weekends at most on the marketplace. Now we're looking at the seller's ask price adjustments. And this is a fairly new metric, but it was one I introduced a while ago now, maybe a year ago. And what it's doing is it's saying, let's look at what the ask pricers are doing because if the sellers come on the marketplace, they're not getting the activity level they were expecting, they're going to lower their price. If sellers are lowering their price by larger and larger percentages, that suggests that they were over anticipating where the market was or the market is going down and they're trying to catch up to the marketplace. These numbers are pretty reasonable. Redwood City is actually a pretty high number with almost a 3% price reduction. Oakland at 1.3. But a lot of these areas like Union City, Newark, raising the ask price by 1%. And, you know, it does happen, but it doesn't happen very much. And it's what I call a tight metric from a half percent above the original ask price to a quarter percent below is what I consider to be a seller's marketplace. Basically, sellers, if sellers are getting their asking price, clearly not a buyer's marketplace. If you have a one percent to five percent price reduction, it's a buyer's marketplace. Now, of course, you can have a greater reduction than five percent of the markets really in the tank. But that's the 5%, the lower number is where my color gets saturated in the same. And in fact, we have an example right now of where the market, where the sellers are raising their price by more than a half percent. The half percent ceiling is just where I saturate my colors because they're so rare. So the difference between three tenths and 1% is really going to be the same difference as between three tenths of a percent and a half percent or five tenths of a percent. Moving on to the frequency of the seller's ask price reduction. So this is how, what percentage of the sellers are reducing their price. And you can see in Silicon Valley, it's only 1% in Cupertino, 5% in Milpitas, you know, around 10% in the rest of the county. You go up into San Mateo County, and I would basically say maybe 10%, and you go over into Alameda County, and every area is under 10, except for Oakland and you have an area of only 1% and an area at 3%. So clearly, Santa Clara and Alameda are the fast marketplaces. And within that, there's clearly micro market areas that are doing better. And again, I'd point out that if you looked at any one of these counties, you know there's going to be a difference between a 1% of the sellers reducing their price and 11 or 12% of the sellers reducing their price. And that's, again, one of the reasons I introduced micro markets. Now we're looking at flipping over and looking at them, what the buyer is doing when they're coming in trying to get an offer accepted. The drawback of this metric is you have to wait for escrows to close. So it's lagging by four, five, six weeks. So these are mar accurate market conditions, but they're where the market was five, four, five, six weeks ago, not where the market is today. You can't use this information to go in and successfully purchase a property today. And besides, any one property is not going to follow the statistics. Statistics are designed to give, give you numbers that let you encompass a large amount of data that you wouldn't be able to otherwise incorporate in just looking at the data. So statistics are a very useful tool. 
You can also make them say anything you want them to say. My goal is to try to understand the marketplace and present it. And that's all the processing all the time is how do I reflect the marketplace, not how do I make the marketplace look hotter than it is. In fact, basically, since about 1998, Silicon Valley has spent far more time in a seller's marketplace than a buyer's marketplace. You know, the one exception was like 2007 through 2010, when the market was doing the mortgage meltdown that we all went through, and then the stock market meltdown. Anyway, you can see the amount of overbidding, and these are average, including those that do not overbid. So if someone comes in and gets a property 3%, 2% below asking price, that's included in here. And you can see the expensive areas in San Mateo County are averaging 1.4% below the seller's ask price. And we're, I thought I saw a real high number down here. Foster City is at 13% above, and that may be the highest. I thought I saw one that was even higher. Berkeley down here at 14%. So it's not uncommon for sellers to get, you know, 5% above their asking price, 9%, 10% above their asking price. Now, this is the frequency of overbidding. How common is overbidding? And you can really see a split in Santa Clara County. Basically, the affordable areas are sitting at somewhere around 60% of the sellers are getting more than their asking price. The moderately affordable areas are right around 82%. The more expensive areas, Cupertino Sunnyvale is at 88 but then you go up into the more expensive areas and it's down more around 55%. San Mateo County is lower, basically, you know, 50%. Probably you have as low as a third in the expensive areas and as much as two thirds in the Bay Cities. Foster City, again, we've talked about it a lot. It's all over the place and it's 100%. But again, that's a very small market, micro market area. And I, I think I said there was like eight active listings. And if I can see that data in my presentation, I'll point it out. And then in San, uh, Alameda County, it's basically maybe around three quarters of the sellers are getting more than their asking price. Now we're looking at the appreciation. So this isn't current market conditions, but these are what, what's happened with prices over the last 10 years. I used nine, the last nine months, second, third, and fourth quarter of 2015 as my base. I was trying for a whole year. I did not feel comfortable using a whole year because of the run-up in prices we typically have in the first quarter of every year. And you can really see the San Mateo expensive areas, the areas that used to be the center of uh, the real estate marketplace are have the least appreciation. And they're also the areas that are closest to the job center. Most of the areas that are outlying have the most appreciation. So basically what I believe this is directly related to is the pandemic. We had a time when everybody wanted to be close to work because you had to commute in five days a week, basically close to eight to six, something like that, depending seven to six, depending on how dedicated you were. Now we have the ability to work more flexible hours and in some cases remotely. And even if you have to go into the office, the requirement is in the office for three days. The hours of the day are smaller. They may be from like 10 to two or something like that. So you can avoid the commute more and therefore outlying areas are become more desirable, which actually spreads out the commute and makes the commute longer. And it's actually getting pretty bad again, but that's okay. You know, people are willing to do it. I personally like having a very short commute. Now what we're doing is instead of just following the median price, which is the middle number, we're following, we're sandwiching that with the cheapest 10% and the most expensive 10% in every age geographical area. I think this is extremely helpful because it gives you an idea of what price range you can find in any area. For example, if you're looking to buy a million dollars and you go up there and look and you go, okay, I can go up into Berkeley and I can get a, you know, occasional house at, at a million. In Oakland, I can get a whole lot. Of, I can get 50% of the homes at a million. In San Leandro, 50%. In Union City, Newark, I can't even get 10%. Fremont, way less than 10%. Pleasant, less than 10%. In Dublin, Castro Valley, and Livermore, I can get about 10%. So it gives you a range. It gives you a better sense of what's going on. And typically, the dollar amount between the lower number and the middle number, and we're looking at base cities, is 6000 and the number from the middle to the higher number is in rough terms, 1,400, 1 1.4 million. So it's much more spread out. And that's basically the bell shape of the curve. 
lower priced homes are tend to be more uh, densely populated. So they take, it takes a less of an increase in dollars to reach the first 40% than the second 40%. Here's a summary of what we've been going over. The first two slides uh, columns by themselves, the active inventory compared to normal and the number of offers compared to normal don't tell you what the market is. It only tells you half. It tells you what the active inventory is and basically you have a shortage of inventory compared to normal. And it tells you what the offers is, which we, we have a shortage of inventory. But it isn't until you come over into the days of unsold inventory, the speed of the marketplace that you're talking about market conditions. That's the yellow highlight. Those are current market conditions. So these five columns up here are the five columns that really tell you what the market is doing today. The orange two columns tell you where the market was five weeks ago. And then the last two columns are just historical information for the appreciation. The sold price is current information, but it really isn't market conditions. It's just telling you what the price is. It is a market condition, but not as far as activity and speed. And then I've added in the payment. The payment and the price go together because they all go through the same formula. I assume an 80% loan, which is pretty unrealistic when you're talking about the 80 percentile home. But, and I'm also using the national median uh, jumbo loan money just because it's an easy to find index. Now what we're doing is putting all those micro markets in a blender and looking at the three components. The three components are inventory and you can see we're down here somewhere around 75% of the inventory that we normally would expect this time of the year. Then you're looking at the number of offers and that's about 80% of where you'd expect it to be. And because the offers are at a higher level than the level of active inventory, the DUI is lower than you would expect it to be, which is a faster marketplace. It's somewhere around 90%. So the market overall in Silicon Valley is 10% faster than it typically is at this time of the year. And that's based on 10 years. I'm putting up this chart and then one line that I think is really important is always the last line. And the real takeaway is these 25. We have the least amount of offers being accepted out of the last 25 years. The previous record low was in 2008 at 2011. This year, we're only selling 1,840 homes. So we're 90%, 91 and of the re previous record low. So we're nine, eight and a half percent lower than our previous record low over the last 25 years. Over the last tw 10 years, we're 20% lower than the previous level for the past 10 years. I'm sorry, but that number has to be significant. And it, not in the 20% over the 10 years, but the fact that we're not eight and a half percent below our record low over the last 25 years. And that's basically all I have the data for. These record lows are pretty significant. Now we're moving on and looking at the estimated payments. And again, I've already talked about the most expensive person that's buying the most expensive homes are typically not going to be doing an 80% loan, but this is the payment almost 24, 2450, 24,500 for the most expensive homes in Silicon Valley. The median priced home gives you a monthly payment of somewhere around 11,500, 12,000. It's hard to really see on this scale. And then your cheapest 10 percentile home gives you a payment around 6,500 a month. Obviously you can buy a townhouse or a condo and have lower payments. You can buy a fixer upper and have lower payments. You can buy in one of the most inexpensive areas and have lower payments. Now we're looking at the ask price reductions, and this is a pretty good indicator of where the market's doing. Several things on the slide that are noteworthy. This is the coolest week we ever had down here, this blue dashed line. The hottest week we ever had was the red dashed line right up here at the top, and basically no sellers were taking any price reductions at all. The green dashed dotted line right here at the top in the upper left corner is the current week's data and current week is through midnight Thursday. And that's because I use a real estate year. It starts on March the 1st, moves forward seven days. When I get around to February 22nd, I jump forward to eight days back to March 1st on a normal year. This year I had to jump nine days for leap year. And I, the reason I'm using the real estate 
year instead of a calendar year is so that I have one discontinuity because we have 365 days in three years and 366 days, which gives you one extra day or two extra days. And I want to compare the same day year after year after year. Now, the disadvantage is like an active inventory, which varies depending on the day of the week. The day of the week does change, and that would impact the number of active listings. And I am going to try to move that over to a seven moving average so that it doesn't impact the data, but I have not done that yet. The other thing that's noteworthy on here is this blue dash dotted line that's bold here, sort of in the middle of the screen going right through where my blue red lines um, boxes meet. That is where we were this week a year ago. So you can see the market is significantly better this year on the green dash dotted line versus the blue dash dotted line. So there's a huge improvement in measured in the reduction of seller price reductions from last year to this year. Now, what we're going to do is step through and watch this up. You can see that right there nine months ago was sort of the peak of the marketplace. Then it cooled off and then it got to the end of the year. So four, three months ago, we're at the end of the year. And now right about there, we took off. So basically six, seven weeks ago, we started taking off. And again, this year up here is significantly better than we were a year ago. And it's not bolded, so it's hard to pull up but it's down here and I'll try to pull it, um, bold it out for next week. Now we're flipping over and looking at the same concept with the overbidding. Then the red dotted line is the best week we ever had, which was March 29th of 2022, just before the market really crashed. And remember that's lagging by four, five, six weeks. So the real crash in the marketplace happened back around Valentine's of 2022, which is earlier than nearly anybody claims. The blue dotted line here is the worst week we ever had, which was back on November 30th of 2001. A year ago, you were this blue dotted line down here, and now you're up here on this green dotted dashed line. So again, you can see there's a huge improvement or a huge increase, and not necessarily an improvement, but a huge increase in the magnitude and frequency of overbiddings by the buyers from a year ago to this year. Now we'll step through. You can see you came, there's about the peak. So just about uh, eight months ago, then you can see it cooling off. Now you can see that's just about the bottom and we're at the plateau. And now you're starting to creep up. So about three weeks ago, you started to creep up. But again, that's lagging behind by, let's call it five weeks. So two months ago, eight weeks ago is when the market started to uh, heat up again. And, you know, we got, got to remember that through November uh, 11th, the 49ers were in the Super Bowl. Everything that increases social obligations negatively impacts real estate. So even though the real estate market was improving eight weeks ago, which was before the Super Bowl had happened, it was not improving as much as it normally does because the 49ers were in the Super Bowl. Here's the active inventory. The three lines on here, the red line is always going to be the hot marketplace. The thin gray line is the what the market should be, the typical marketplace based on 10 years. And the blue is a cool marketplace and the purple is the data. You can see we have active inventory that's behaving exactly where you'd expect it to be. But we've been basically having very limited inventory since the beginning of January of 2023. So we're now in 15, 16 months of very limited inventory. Here, it is it compared to normal, and you're basically somewhere around 75% of the inventory you'd expect to have based on this time of the year. Basically, this takes that gray line and straightens it out, and we compare the percentage. So here, we're back to the curved lines that show you the annual cycle. Now, you're below, the number of offers is below the least amount of offers you would expect, and it's hard to judge the payment because it's the vertical, uh, the percentage because it's the vertical separation. And that's why on the next slide, we take that gray line straightening out. And you can see that you're down here at 80% of the normal level of offers that you would expect to have. So we're 20% short on the level of transactions. Here's now days on sold inventory, the same concept. You're between the gray line, the typical and a hot marketplace. So the market's a little bit faster than you would expect. You flip over here and you see that it's around 87%, so about 13% faster than you would expect. Now you're looking at just the raw count. 
the red marketplace being the hottest marketplace you'd expect to have. And that's basically where the purple line is. And you move over and you can see you're down here around 50% of the speed of the marketplace. And that means we're selling in half the time that we normally do. And if you look back over 10 years, you can see that rarely is the market this fast compared to where it should be. So rarely is it half the speed of what it should be. The other thing I want to point out that I haven't this week is from 2023 onward, the x-axis has really expanded out. And that's so you can see these little ups and downs. And then from 2023 backwards in time, it's condensed so that I can fit on 10 years worth of data all on the graph. So to the left, it's more condensed and to the right, it changes on January of 2023. And here you can see the price reductions. So this is a leading indicator. And you can see that sellers are taking more price reductions than they typically do. And you can also see that it almost looks like it's rolling over and coming back down towards a cooler marketplace. Now, this could be certain areas like the expensive areas in San Mateo County and the coast uh, accounting for this increase. And here you are, you can see that it's a little bit better than normal, but it's getting pretty close to normal. But where are we? The average price reduction is something like 99.8%. So two tenths, maybe it's only one tenth. And I will put in some more fainter horizontal lines if I remember to make it easier to read those. And here's the sellers. So this is sort of a unique concept. You know, typically with statistics, you want to look at what the market's doing, the middle of the marketplace, maybe the first through the third qu uh, quadrant of what the market's doing. On price reductions, I'm arguing that basically very few percent of the sellers do the price reductions. So I'm here, I'm looking at only what the 10% of the sellers that are taking the largest price reductions, how much of a price reductions are they taking? And you can see they're taking more than normal. They're below the typical, which would be up here. So just in the last couple of weeks, they started to increase. So it's almost like some part of the marketplace has come on, found out the market isn't where they thought it would be and they're having to take bigger price reductions. Here's the percentage of those price reductions, and it's 20% above where you'd expect it to be. And you can see the sharp increase just in the last two weeks. Moving on to the frequency. So how common are price reductions? Again, you were right on the typical line, the gray line, and now you're bent up and you're going towards a cool marketplace. You come over here and you can see that boom, you were on the gray line. And now you've moved up and you're maybe at a 5% above where you normally would expect the frequency. So you have 5% more sellers taking price reductions. Not a huge amount, but you know it's a noteworthy and it's a current marketplace. Now you're looking at overbidding. The overbidding lags behind, but here the buyers are coming in and they're overbidding more significantly than they normally do because they're closer to the, they're not closer to, but they're between the red line and the gray line instead of between the gray line and the blue line. And you put that on a percentage basis and there's 2% more overbidding than there normally is. Going on to frequency, frequency is pretty close to the gray line, but again, it's a little bit above and that's what you'd expect here. It's close, but you know, it's above. It's maybe what, 8% more frequent to have more frequent overbidding than typical. Here is the median sold price and this is on log paper. So you can see the end of the dip that's basically very consistent. We sort of had a U dip Back here in 2021, we had a U dip when the market was on fire. And now we're going up and we're almost back to the long term appreciation line. Now we're looking at the active inventory. Here we're looking at each of the three counties put in a blender. So you have Santa Clara County in the blue, you have Alameda County in the gray, and you have San Mateo County in the orange. And this basically is based on the county size. So Alameda County is usually the biggest, followed by Santa Clara and San Mateo is almost always the smallest. It's nothing more than they have less population, less number of homes, so they're going to have less inventory. Now you look at the number of offers accepted, and this changes it around. In fact, Santa Clara County has more offers than Alameda County, and Alameda County had more inventory. So that tells you right off the bat, the speed of the marketplace is quite a bit faster in Santa Clara County. And here you can see it. Santa Clara County is the fastest followed by San Mateo County and Alameda County is the slowest. And by the slowest, it's still somewhere only around 32 days, which is still a seller's marketplace. Here's the 75th percentile. 
this is time on the marketplace. So Santa Clara County might be 11, 12 days. Alameda County and San Mateo County are very close together, maybe around 15 days for 75% of the sellers to sell. Here's your price reductions. Santa Clara County is doing the least price reduction because here's 100%, here's 99 So all three counties are doing less than 1% because this is everybody in a blender. And here's the frequency of the price reductions. Santa Clara County has the least at maybe 7.5%, maybe it's only 7%. San Mateo County may be closer to seven and a half, and then Alameda County may be eight or eight and a half percent of the sellers are doing price reductions. Magnitude of overbidding. Here's what the buyer is doing. So even though Santa Clara County had the faster marketplace, buyers in Alameda County are more aggressive when it comes to the average overbid. And that's actually not what one would expect. Here's the frequency of overbidding. Alameda County is beating out Santa Clara. Santa Clara, according to my data, has the faster marketplace, but the buyers in Alameda County are bidding up higher than they are in Santa Clara County. Here's the appreciation. Santa Clara County still has the most appreciation, but noteworthy, look how rapidly this appreciation in Alameda County has come up. Alameda County is now above their previous number for 2023. Santa Clara County is still below the number and San Mateo County is sort of right at the number. So Alameda County is doing the best uh, overall on that metric. Now, looking back in time, San Mateo County has sort of the most amount of transactions back here in 2021 and 2022 that are above the current price. Santa Clara County has the least in just this range. Alameda County is not much difference, but you got the same range here and you don't have any here, but you're close. See how much closer you are to the peak here where Santa Clara County is above. So that gives you an idea that, you know, the prices fell and they came back up and they're closer to the peak in Santa Clara County than any other county. But the other three or two counties are not far behind. Here's the same information on regular paper for those that prefer instead of log. And here's the estimated payments that are in the same order because the formula is the same. Now here's the numbers. You can pick Santa Clara, San Mateo, or Alameda County, or all three together. Seeing what's going on, you can see that active inventory has increased a little bit. The number of new listings coming on the market is up about 8% across the board. And now we're moving on to the Greater Bay Area. The Greater Bay Area is 13 counties, five regions. We've been talking about region one in components. We're gonna add in San Francisco and Marin, the cities, North Bay, Central Valley and the Central Coast. Here are the numbers for you. That way you can come back and look at whatever county or region you're interested in. And I also will point out, I have the Bay Area on here, which are the nine counties that touch the Bay. The media often reports on what's happening in the Bay Area. I put it in so that you can see what's happening in the Bay Area compared to any one area. And none, none of the nine counties I would wager on any given month or any given week is performing like the Bay Area. So the Bay Area data is sort of meaningless because you don't have a Bay Area home. Here's your active inventory. You can see inventory is down from below from the where it typically is. So it's shortage of inventory across the board. Number of offers is also down across the board. Speed of the marketplace, Silicon Valley, then Central Valley, then North Bay and the cities tied and the Central Coast being the slowest area. Here are the time on the marketplace. You can really see Silicon Valley with the time on the marketplace being about 14, 15 days. And that's all three counties. Then you have the cities next. Then you have Central Valley at just under 40 days. North Bay at just over 40 days. And the Central Coast is way up here at about 58 days to sell 75% of the homes. Here's the price reductions. The least in Silicon Valley followed by Central Valley, followed by North Bay. Then you have the cities and the Central Coast. So you can see the order does change depending on the metric on the frequency of price reductions, the least in Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is uh, hotter than the, any others. And that makes sense because it's the job center. And then you have uh, the cities next. And then you have Central Valley and North Bay right close together. And the Central Coast has the most. Magnitude of overbidding. This is the magnitude of overbidding. Silicon Valley the most, followed by the cities, followed by the North Bay, followed by Central Valley. I believe one of the reasons Central Valley is low is people that are going out to Central Valley are typically doing so for affordability reasons. 
and then the central coast has the least amount of overbidding. This is the frequency of overbidding. This order is basically the same. The Silicon Valley, the cities, North Bay, Central Valley, and then the Central Coast. Here's the long-term appreciation. Central Valley has outpaced everybody, including Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley has skyrocketed very significantly. Look how much we've come up since the first of the year, and we're now above where we were. So Central Valley goes down less, and I believe that's basically the type of people that are buying and the the amount of impact the holidays have depends on, on the region. Here's the sold price for the five regions. Here's the monthly payments in the same order as the price. And with that, we've made it through the presentation. So let me explain my URLs. The blue URL is my YouTube archive. You can type it in and it is a lot of typing. So I've come up with what I call the green root URL. And that becomes key because if you add in 2024, you can join the live presentation Saturday morning at nine o'clock, ask questions. And the handout, I try to get that up around 8.45 in the morning. I was about five minutes late this morning, but it is up. So you just type in the green root URL and then H for handout 2024-0316 for today's date. And you'll get 63, 64 slides. The key slides of the PowerPoint, the only ones that I don't do are sort of like my movies that are repetitive. So that way you can look at them, you can pull them down before the presentation. And then if you want any specific episode, you can either go to the channel and then the link, or you can type in the green root URL and without the H, so just the green root URL, the year, month, date code. Again, I'm Richard Calhoun with Creekside Realty. My contact information, my email address is on every slide, so you can reach out and ask me questions or ask me to represent you as either a buyer or a seller. I'll come back and verify that nobody's got a question. The data being presented here is the most extensive local Silicon Valley-based real estate data and most current available. I look at data that most people do not look at. I don't look at median or average days on market. Instead, I look at the 75th percentile of time of successful sellers. The reason that number is so beneficial is it tells only the sellers that price their home appropriately to sell, how long is it taking the long typical seller to sell? Not the seller that underprices it and has a price war that sells the first week, but those that price it a little bit on the high side, potentially buyers have to come in, kick the tires, make an offer. Basically, 75% of the sellers are selling quicker than that. 25% are taking longer than that. I also look at the magnitude of the seller price reductions. How big are the price reductions and how frequent are those price reductions in order for the seller to attract the buyer to write the offer? I also look at the frequency and magnitude of overbidding, not just the average. I look at the whole distribution everywhere from the fifth percentile to the 95th percentile. So you see where 90% of the homes are. I leave out the outlying 5% because they're statistical fluctuations, their input errors, and they skew the data. So I look at 90% of the marketplace to get a better feeling what the market's doing. I look at micro markets. I've selected 20 micro markets in Silicon Valley. A couple of them are very small, like Foster City Redwood Shores, but a lot of them are large enough that they give you meaningful statistical data on what's happening in an area. Yes, that doesn't tell you what the value you should offer on a particular home is, but it gives you an idea of what the trends are, what the annual trend is. Also, I don't look at pending data. Pending data is biased based on the transactions that are take the longest to close. The more difficult transactions impact the data for a longer period of time than the cash transactions that close in a week. By looking at offers accepted, every transaction counts the same, whether you close in a week or close in 10 weeks. It makes no difference when you look at simply the number of offers that are being accepted. I also look at weekly data. And the reason I look at weekly data is the real estate market is heavily dependent on weekend activity. Buyers go out on the weekend, properties become available for showing on the weekend, offers are then looked at during the following week. So there's a huge weekly cycle. That weekly cycle gets impacted by holidays. So if we have Valentine's Day and Mother's Day that positively impacts the real estate marketplace or pretty much any other holiday negatively impacting the real estate market, that's important to understand. So instead of looking at monthly data, 
which even has a varying number of days of the week in it from one month to another, by looking at weekly data, I, I normalize all that. I also look at a real estate calendar year. My real estate calendar year starts on March 1st, and then I march forward seven days at a time until you get to February 21st. And then instead of marching forward seven days to February 28th, I jump eight days back to March 1st. So you're comparing the same date of the year to the same date of the year. The drawback of doing that is that date of the year does vary. It, one year, one year it'd be a Monday, then it'd be a Tuesday, then it'd be a Wednesday. And then, but the huge advantage is when you have leap year, you simply jump forward to nine days and get back to March 1st instead of jumping forward seven or eight days. So your data is more consistent. There is a little bit of a drawback, but it's far better than comparing January with 31 days. You don't have an even number of weeks and weekends in there. The number of weekdays and weekends vary from year to year. So that's a huge impact on the data. So I made a lot of decisions to make the data more representative of what the market's actually doing. I also look at simply the components, the active listings. I compare that number of active listings currently to the 10-year median. I look at the number of offers. I compare that to the 10-year median. I do the same with days of unsold inventory. In fact, I was the one that introduced days of unsold inventory, and that's the speed of the marketplace. And I simply look at the raw count. Basically, it, roughly speaking, anything that sells with a days of unsold inventory of less than six weeks is a strong seller's marketplace. Over 11 weeks tends to be a strong buyer's marketplace. So you can look at each one of those metrics individually. On median sold price, which almost everybody follows and reports, I also report the 10 percentile price and the 90 percentile price. That gives you a huge advantage because now that price point for each micro market is sandwiched you know the lowest price point that you'd expect and the highest price point you can expect. I also look at the appreciation, both short term since the pandemic in 2020, but I also look longer term since the last three quarters of 2015. I was hoping to do a full calendar year, but I wanted a period of time when prices were relatively stable. And unfortunately, they weren't very stable in the first part of 2015. So that was the most stable price point I could find. So you can see whether buying in Alameda County or in San Mateo County has been a better investment over the long term. It turns out that because of the pandemic, it's further away from the job center. But that's, you know, it's going to be different from time to time. And past performance doesn't predict future performance, but it's still interesting to look at. I also present the data on visually on maps so you can see the trends. You can see where the market is hot. You can see cool spots. You can really see it visually and you get a better feel for what's going on. Yes, when you get down to making an offer on any particular home, you want to look at a detailed CMA, but the micro market data gives you a better idea of what's going on. A lot of people report data by zip codes. But the problem with zip codes are they could be in different school districts. They could be too small and you have statistical fluctuation. In fact, even my smallest micro market that I can think of has multiple zip codes in it to try to stabilize the data. And right now we're having record low number of transactions, which makes the data more unstable because you want a large group. And that was sort of the mindset behind the micro markets is trying to get a larger group that you could of geographically close and similar type properties to define a larger market so that you get better statistical, meaningful data. Anyway, that's a quick recap of what I typically am trying to present on this data. I'm open for any suggestions on the people out there, the viewers on you know, what I should do slightly different, what I could do to improve the data, what metric am I not following? Because the sum of all my viewers is greater than my knowledge. And I learn from you guys all the time. So I appreciate that. We've been talking about Silicon Valley real estate market geographically and graphically in the Silicon, here in Silicon Valley, plus the greater Bay Area, which is 13 counties in five regions. This has been week number 10. You can look at any archive on the YouTube by typing in the blue YouTube or uh, URL, or you can type in the shorter green tiny URL uh, URL. I call the green one my root URL. If you add 2024 to that Saturday morning at 9 a.m., you get to the live presentation. 
and you can ask questions as we present or at the end of the presentation. And if you want a handout, it's the green root, root URL plus H2024. 0309 for the current year month date of the presentation. My data is now through midnight on Thursday because of the calendar year. And if you want a, a specific episode, you'd start off with the green root URL and add in 2024-0309 or whatever episode it is you want. I'm Richard Calhoun with Creekside Realty. I've been working here in Silicon Valley since 1981. My email address and phone number is on every slide. Look forward to helping anybody with any questions. And thanks for joining me because I don't see anyone with unmuted mic. Thanks. Bye for now.